Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're talking to a woman who has set the standard for barbecue business in Australia. Hey family, I hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. In this episode of the podcast, we're talking to Rhiannon Peterson from Barbecue Spit Rotisseries, one of the most well-known independent barbecue stores with shops in Sydney and Melbourne and a huge supporter of the competition barbecue teams around Australia. So we're super lucky to have her here and I'm really looking forward to getting into this chat with her. But before we get into that, I've got a couple of announcements that I need to run by you first. First up, I want to thank Jagged Woodfired for coming on board as our podcast partner for this episode. If you're out there and you're looking for a new smoker, if you're looking for a gravity-fed cabinet or you're looking for a smoker oven or you're looking for an asado, make sure you check them out. I've got one of the smoker ovens here at the moment I've been doing some videos with and it is a great bit of kit. You can check out those videos, have a look at them if you like. It's a fantastic bit of gear, you won't be disappointed. Now, if you're at the start of your barbecue journey, head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com. We've got a free ebook available for you. It's the Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. And inside that, you're going to find everything you need to know to go from zero to hero in the world of low and slow barbecue. It's completely free. You're going to head on over there, smokinghotconfessions.com. A pop-up window will appear. Put your details in that, and we'll shoot it straight out to your inbox for you. And a big thanks to everybody who's joining us this evening in the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community over on Facebook. You're obviously keen to be here and uh, and be part of this live podcast recording with Rhiannon. It's great to see you there. We've got all sorts of people commenting here. We've even got the one and only Robert Maxworthy joining us here tonight. So that's going to be a bit of a crack up. I'm going to have to keep an eye on the uh, comments and see what I filter in and out of the live recording. But uh, I'm sure he'll behave himself. <laughs> All right, now if you are watching this later on on YouTube, do give us a thumbs up, a subscribe, and hit that little notification bell. Over on Facebook, it's all about the likes, the comments, and the shares. On Instagram, we love the little love hearts and the comments, and of course, make sure you're following us as well. And if you are listening in on a podcasting app later on, make sure you rate and review. Five stars really helps drive us up the charts and helps us spread our love of barbecue. Now, I reckon that's probably all you need to hear from me spruiking the show and, uh, and, and talking about Rhiannon. Let's get her in here. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Hello, Rhiannon. Good evening. It's great to have you here. Long time no see. I hope you're well. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Any time. I, I know you're really busy, so I really appreciate you taking time out to uh, to jump on board and talk about some barbecue with us. Now, no the first thing that I ask everybody is what was the last thing that you barbecued? <laughs> well, I'm actually cooking a lamb and chicken um, Greek style yiddle right now. Right now. Beautiful. Right now. It's actually going. I'm still at work. Um, it's cooking in our studio. We've been doing some filming today, so that's going right now. So as soon as I'm off, I'm going to go and tuck in. Nice. Now, is that staff dinner or is that actually part of one of the videos? Um, no, it's actually a video. Um, the staff aren't hanging around. I didn't really want to share it with them today. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> they might get some leftovers for lunch tomorrow if they're lucky. Oh, fair enough. That sounds nice. Now, what is your favourite thing to barbecue? What do you like to cook for yourself? Oh, I've got a couple of favourites. So I love a pork belly. Um, cooked in a basket over, um, obviously, obviously charcoal over a rotisserie is probably my favourite way to do it. Um, and I love a good rare reverse seared eye fillet. Can't go Ooh, past that. Rare yeah. even. Rare, yeah. I just have, I love it rare. Right. And so <laughs> you said uh, re- reverse sear. So you basically just like to just get just the very outer layer sort of nicely crusted and then all the inside That's beautiful it. pink. Absolutely. Yep. And everyone else looks at it and balks at it thinking that I'm eating it raw, but I love it. Right. And what, Again, what do you I don't have to share. So I think I'm, t- you know, swaying my food choices. I'll get more of it for myself. Well, if you're the boss then you get to make the rules, don't you? That's right. I pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what barbecue do you like to do those reverse seared steaks on? Uh, well, we've recently become a distributor for SNS Grills, which is a barbecue that we import out of the States. So we're getting um, to learn that. It's just a kettle barbecue, um, like similar to a Weber, but we've been um, doing that a lot lately. 
Oh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, they're, they're quite well known over, over in the US. Absolutely. So it's uh, got two zones. So obviously um, you can then sear it directly over the sear grill. Oh, sounds delicious. You have to have a, <laughs> have a bit of a look at them and, uh, and, and see what you got there in the shop. It yeah. sounds fantastic. And so is that your, your favourite type of barbecue? Like, like what, what barbecue do you have in your backyard at home? <laughs> Too many. Too many. So I've got um, I've got a Pro Q. I've got a Cypress Spit rotisserie, um, an Oz Spit, which I cook over just um, a fire pit on the ground. Um, pizza oven. So a wood fire pizza oven gets fired up a bit to do some pizzas and that. And I have just scored myself a, a Kamado as well. So and obviously at the shop, I've got every barbecue under the sun you can imagine, but they're the ones just at home. Well, that was why I was curious because you do own a barbecue shop. You've got your choice of like I do, but I can't have a whole backyard models. full of barbecues. So yeah. I've got to limit my choices at home. Yeah, no doubt about that. Now, tell me a bit more about the Auspit. I, I like to do a lot of four-wheel drive camping, so they're really oh. interesting to me. Tell me about them. Yeah, so it's basically just a portable camping unit. Um, it was designed um, to be cooked over an open flame when you're out and about, so you can just light a fire on the ground. Um, it's basically got a... Um, a post which gets pegged into the ground and then a horizontal rotisserie bar which just swings over the open fire. So, again, there's other attachments that you can use for it. So you've obviously got baskets for it, you've got tumblers, you've got hot plates and grills that all can attach to that. Obviously at home I didn't want to light up a fire on the, the ground, so I do actually have a fire pit that I build the fire in, but certainly when going out and about you just have an open fire on the ground. Oh, that sounds amazing! I'd I'd, I'd love to, uh, to to check that out. What's your favorite thing to do on it? It takes up no as well, so it's really handy. Yeah, yeah. What's your favorite thing to put on the ospit? Again, pork belly, <laughs> pork belly in that basket. Just the way that it crisps up is uh, amazing. Yeah, it's hard to go past a good bit of pork belly, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I'm just going through a bit of a phase at the moment with the pork belly. I think. Nice. And do you always get that beautifully, uh, beautifully crunchy skin there? Most times. I can't say that I'm perfect. There have been times where I've gotten a little bit distracted and, uh, you know, end up with a bit of a flare up, but it hasn't turned out quite, you know, video worthy, but most times, yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. So let's go back in time a bit. Tell me how, how did you get into barbecue? Did you grow up in a barbecue family or is it something you came to later in life? Uh, I came to it later in life, to be honest. My family was not great cooking on the barbecue. I am almost a little bit embarrassed to say that we did not have a charcoal barbecue growing up. It was all gas and it was cremated. The meat was so burnt and well done I and not seasoned. So, <laughs> yes, not a great start in life. Um, it wasn't until I met my business partner that then I really learned how to, to cook meat and really fell in love with it. Yeah, I think uh, it, it was quite similar for me growing up in the 80s. If it wasn't black on the outside and raw in the middle, then it wasn't done right. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> exactly right. Gosh. But I'm, I'm slowly turning my family around. They're not quite onto the raw steaks yet um, or the rare steaks, but, um, you know, they, they're up to about medium at the moment. All right. So yeah. where do you stand then on, on things like the, the beef sashimi? Is that too far? Oh, that's a bit too far. A bit too far for me. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I, I I don't think I could uh, quite go there myself either. I don't think. No, no. Yeah. So, whenabouts then was that when you got into the charcoal barbecues? Yeah. So, about probably about fifteen years ago, which is around about just before we started the business, actually. So, my business partner is Greek, and obviously Greeks. He grew up with cooking with charcoal, you know, every family celebration, you know, there's something cooking on the spit, whether it's a big, um, you know, lamb yiddle or a whole lamb on a spit. Um, so going over there and seeing that, um, yeah, is what made me fall in love with the whole cooking over charcoal and, and spit roasting. And so what was your first barbecue after you discovered charcoal? Did you go the Weber or, or, or did you go straight to like a spit rotisserie? No, it's straight to a spit. Yeah, had to test the merchandise. Yeah. Fair enough, so yeah. our main, our first products were spit um, lamb, uh, sorry, spits to cook whole lambs on. So, yeah, it was literally just getting a whole lamb from the butcher and chucking it on and, and running with it. Never looked back since then. 
That's quite brave because if you've got like a whole lamb and it's your first go and you mess it yeah. up, you've messed up a whole lamb. Was that nerve wracking when you were first getting into it? Um, well, everyone knows everything about cooking on a spit. So once you surround yourselves with Greeks, they're there telling you exactly how to do it. Trust me. <laughs> so there was no chance of stopping it up. <laughs> Uh, Fair enough. And um, unlike a pig, you don't cook a lamb with a whole head on, so that wasn't quite as daunting. Yeah, not not quite as intimidating for the first time as when you're uh, cooking it like it looks like it was was alive ten minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you ever seen a lamb cooked with the head on? Um, I think I have, but I grew up mm-hmm. on a farm, so uh, it almost turns I, into an alien like you know creature. It does. Very bizarre. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, the kind of thing that you'd see little kids running around screaming. I think I I have memories of, of, as a kid of uh, going out and visiting a friend of mine's farm, and uh, his his father grew sheep, and every now and again they would uh, knock off a weather or something to to mm. to eat, and um, he loved the brain. Oh, and no. so we we had to actually like split the skull to get the brain out. Oh uh, it dear, was, yeah. So for, in the Greek culture. Um, there's this thing called kokoretsi and what it is, it's the intestines that they take out and then cook that as well. It's a delicacy, but I can't say I was ever brave enough to try that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I could do that. I'm not sure I could do that. (laughs) Um, so what is it that, that keeps you so passionate about barbecue? I mean, you've, you've literally built your whole life around barbecue. What is it that, that, that's really sunk its claws into you and, uh, and, and keeps you hooked? Yeah, I suppose it's the personal connection that we have with our customers. Like we have, as you mentioned, you know, we have a couple of stores and, you know, you'll see people come in that have no idea at all. They're literally coming in to buy their first barbecue. They don't know how to cook charcoal. They know nothing. All they've got at home is their, you know, their gas barbecue. So they'll come in, you'll talk them through that process of, you know, how to cook with charcoal. You know, you've got to educate them right from the ground up. And then those customers turn into regulars. You start seeing them every, you know, every second Friday on their way home from work. And then they'll start showing photos, you know, of what they've cooked on the weekend. And so you see them grow and you see them become masters. Like you you wouldn't believe it, but there's so many teams in the competition barbecue circuit where, you know, I either sold them their first smoker or their first charcoal barbecue. Like smoke face grillers, I sold them their first um, ProQ. That was their first smoker while they're getting their trailer pit. their trailer pit built. So, and then Butcher's Axe, you know, their first charcoal barbecue. So it's, it's amazing to see people how, you know, they start out and then have become really great at what they do. Yeah. I was just um, sort of trawling through your socials there today and I saw a mm. little video of, of Butcher's Axe coming into the store and having a bit of a wander around and a bit, and, and a bit yeah. of a look at stuff there. So, I mean, you've got those, uh, those long standing deep connections to sort of the, yeah. the, the heart of the competition scene as well, which is fantastic. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, they'll come in and they'll help us with a a demo or something like that. So then they're giving back to the community as well. So for me, that's what it's about. You know, it's about everyone's, everyone's so disconnected at the moment, whether it's they're on their phone constantly or they're off in their own little world, but there's something about cooking with fire that just brings people back together and, you know, helps people reconnect again. And it's about creating those memories between family and friends and things that you'll actually remember. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's it's been really interesting to see in the last 18 months where we are all disconnected and mm. we aren't able to use fire and meat to build the physical community around us, how things mm. have moved online and now we've got online barbecue competitions and on, yeah. on more and more online barbecue communities. And so we're still using meat and fire to build community just in a totally different way, which is really interesting. And we're we're going to talk about some of the ways that, uh, that, that BSR has been fostering that in, in just a couple of minutes. But I think that that's really mm-hmm. curious, um, particularly uh, where you are down in Melbourne there. You, you've, you've been locked down for like <laughs> a really long time now. So what, yeah. what, sort, of, what sort of changes have you seen? Um, let's, let's go all the way back to, to 15 years ago and then we'll catch up to where we are now. Mm-hmm. What sort of changes have you seen in the barbecue scene in Australia? I think people are experimenting a lot more. So going back, right back 15 years ago, right, the whole reason we started this business was because when my business partner, Tony, tried to find um, a spit roaster to buy, none existed. 
I know that sounds ridiculous nowadays, how commonplace, you know, spits are, but there was nothing. Bunnings didn't have them. Barbecues galore didn't have them. Literally, the only way you could buy a spit back then was to find a little Greek guy at the Sunday market who would be, you know, he would have made it up himself in his shed and using a windscreen wiper motor to turn the skewer. Oh, wow. That's how things were back then. Um, And... We ended up finding um, a supplier in Greece and we got them in and then we ended up obviously trying to find a supplier in China. And can you believe it? It was probably about 13 years ago. There were no supplies of spit roasters, even on Alibaba. Wow. It just did not exist. So you can imagine us trying to come up with this product that they thought were revolutionary, you know, pairing basically a motor manufacturer with a, um, you know, a hardware manufacturer to come up with what is now quite commonplace of a spit roaster. So that's certainly become a lot more mainstream now. Um, but we're seeing that our spit roasting clients are now dabbling with, you know, pellet grills. They're trying something different. So then, then, then we'll see, I'm sure, in probably six months or a year's time, they'll start going into, you know, an offset smoker. And So we're really starting to see people starting with one barbecue, like a, an easier barbecue, like a, a Weber or a spit roaster, and then progressing as they're trying to experiment. That's interesting that you're saying that you're seeing that the trend moving from pellet grills to offsets because in the competition scene, it's going the, it's other, the other way. way People around. are moving from I, offsets to pellets. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. But from a consumer perspective, like not in the comp scene, yeah, we're seeing people going to a pellet grill because or they may have only um, had a gas barbecue at home, so it's an easy jump or they're now working from home. So they've got the time for a pellet grill. Um, but then as they master that, they actually, they love it so much, they want to be more involved in the process. So, Yeah, well, I guess when you put it like that, a, a pellet grill makes a lot of sense for working at home because you can be sitting here Absolutely. in the office and looking out the window and just keeping an eye on it, but you don't have to be running out and throwing a stick into it every 30 minutes. Yep, exactly right. Yeah, so we saw a huge trend of pellet grills uh, when lockdown first started last year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... What is something that that you'd like to uh, that you'd like to see uh, change or grow or develop in the barbecue scene? What is what what do you think would really add something to the next dimension? Oh gosh, it's putting me on the spot. <laughs> something that I'd like to see. Um, oh gosh, I can't even think. There, I might have to come back to that one. I... Okay, no worries. Sorry, I can't think off the top of my head. That's all right. That's all right. Um, let's. Let's, uh, let's get back to, to, to cooking then. What is something that, that you personally find, find difficult to cook? What's, what's tricky for you after 15 years in the barbecue industry? Um, what's tricky for me? Probably, hmm, I'd probably say brisket if I had to pick something. Probably, I don't have the patience for it, to be honest. Okay. I've done it. Dozens of times, like whenever we used to run um, barbecue classes here, I'd be the bunny that would be here manning the smoker overnight every single time. So I'd be the one getting up in the middle of the night, doing everything. It's, it's not that I find it difficult. I just don't have the, the patience to do it or really the love for it. Fair enough. That's all. Fair enough. Yeah. Totally understand that. And yeah. so, so then what comes easily to you? Like, do, do you find that you're just a master of pork ribs, for example, or beef ribs, or what, what comes easy for you? What comes easy for me? Um, I guess anything on a spit, really. It's just second nature now. You know, you just got your routine set up. You'll get the fire going, go in, quickly get the meat ready, and by the time the fire's ready, then the meat's on, and answering customer phone calls at the same time, getting harassed by staff at the same time. It's literally just second nature. I'm sure Cam wouldn't be harassing you. <laughs> Never, <laughs> never, <laughs> never, no. Look, I have a really good team. I'm, I'm very lucky, but um, yeah. The questions can get a bit much sometimes. <laughs> if you're looking for your next barbecue smoker or grill, Jagged Wood Fired has got what you need. Owners Julianne and Glenn are multiple award-winning barbecue competitors who have even travelled to the US to compete at the World Barbecue Championships in Houston, Texas. Based out of Perth and shipping nationwide, Jagged is one of the largest pit builders in the country and has an ever-growing lineup of meat cooking machinery. 
Not only do they have their now famous smoker ovens, their incredibly efficient gravity fed cabinets are proving extremely popular in commercial settings, and they also make some of the most stylish asado grills you're ever going to see. Jagged is also well known for amazingly detailed custom work ranging from backyard designs all the way to installations in commercial kitchens. Proudly Australian designed, owned and manufactured, you can find out more at jaggedwoodfire.com.au spelled J-A-G-R-D. Once again, head to jaggedwoodfire.com.au spelled J-A-G-R-D to learn more. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. Alrighty, and we're back. So now let's get into BSR. Now you did briefly mention before it started 15 years ago when you met a person from Greece who introduced you to to uh, to spit style cooking. Let's get let's go back to that and and tell us a bit more about the the actual nuts and bolts of of how you got it all started. Sure. So as I mentioned, my business partner Tony, Greek background, wanted to buy a spit and realised one there weren't any models available in Australia. So started looking more and found some or a supplier in Greece. So our first shipment actually came from Greece. Um, we got those in and we were literally selling them out of his parents' shed on a farm about 60K um, away from the Melbourne CBD. And we set up an eBay store. And so literally we'd be selling out of a garden shed on eBay. So not glamorous so awesome. at all. Yeah, and I remember, you know, this was just a part-time thing. Um, I remember having to go to the post office on the way to work, you know, because I'd still, we'd obviously both still have our day jobs, um, you know, answering customer phone calls and emails during lunch breaks and things like that. Um, and then after some time, um, we were getting close to selling out of that stock and we're like, okay, well, we need to get another container in. Things are going quite well. Um, and we had some suggestions for the supplier and they basically told us to bugger off. This is the way we've always done it. We don't want to improve the product. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, wow. like I'm talking <laughs> about um, rotisserie motors that still had a European plug on it. They would not even change the plug to an Australian plug. Oh, so we literally had to wow. get all those converted um, here when the stock landed. So like, oh, there's got to be a better way. So, you know, you obviously hear of everything being made in China nowadays. So, as I said, jumped on Alibaba. Spits didn't exist. So we partnered with a couple of different companies. Um, Tony, my business partner, you know, he had some some designs. So he made some designs and we started production. And so, yeah, the containers kept on coming down to the, the farm shed and <laughs> dealing with that after hours on weekends. And And then what happened? Oh. We decided, well, this is now turning into a bit more of a, a busy thing. So let's move a little bit closer into the city and invest in a factory. So we took out a, a lease on a factory and I had just given up my full-time day job to take things quite seriously. And then one of the retailers that we were selling into let us know that what I thought was the unthinkable, I was obviously very young and naive at the time, um, that someone else had ripped off or basically had approached our supplier in China and had ripped everything off. So, yeah, just taken out a lease on a factory, uh, which was a lot of money back then, you know, when you're starting out, you're just mm. giving up, you know, a highly paid job and then all of a sudden your products are being sold by someone else. They've approached all the retailers you were selling into and they're undercutting you. So oh, that's that was a bit of a oh crap moment um yeah. what do we do but i don't know by some stroke of luck or karma or whatever you want to you whatever you want to call it um within about two weeks i happened to meet someone who had a connection over in china um and that inevitably um we ended up investing in our own manufacturing plant in china so we sold our house we hundreds of thousands of dollars to opening a brand new manufacturing wow. plant in China, which oh. only manufactures for us to make sure that that would never happen again. And 
So thinking back now, I'm like, hmm, that was pretty scary. I'm glad I asked no one for advice because they probably would have told me not to do it. <laughs> Yeah, what what sort of legal repercussion, like uh, n- n- not repercussions, legal recourse do you have in that situation? Because it it sounds like the Chinese manufacturer just handed over the plans and just restamped oh, a different nothing. brand on it. There's nothing. Uh, it's, no, there was nothing back then. I guess I wasn't um, as business savvy as what I what I am now. There was no protection whatsoever. So all we did was basically stop buying from that person. Um, we opened up new molds and bought all new tools and machinery and set up a staff on the payroll over there and just had to start again. But you know what? I be- really believe everything happens for a reason and it was the best thing that could have happened because now I feel like we have protection. We have full control of the manufacturing process in terms of um, like supply chain and also um, quality, mm-hmm. but also like our staff over there understand the product like whenever we go over there and unfortunately we haven't been able to go over there now for you know oh god it's, it feels like it's coming on two years it's probably not that far off but you know we always make sure that we cook when we go over there you know i've done a whole lamb with the team over there and they were involved in the process and and everything like that so having your own team over there certainly has its benefits but um it's i probably would never have gone down that track had the unthinkable happened God, that's absolutely horrifying. So you've, you've, you, <laughs> I'm you've getting obviously had to just thinking about it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you obviously had to like com- like change the designs and that, so that you then weren't infringing on the people that had copied you. Correct. And then and yeah. then somehow protect those new designs. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And so, this all had to happen very quickly. Um, and as I said, it cost a lot of money to do. Um, but we have a business partner over there who also has skin in the game. He obviously put up capital as well. Um, and he hasn't said it's the best thing that could have happened. Yeah, right. And so do you, do you use like uh, international trademarks? Is it the, what's it called? Yeah. The, the, the Monaco convention? Is that what it is? The um, international trademark? It. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So there's, there's trademarks, there's patents on some of the products as well. Yeah, just to try and protect us from that perspective. And look, I mean, we've obviously evolved a lot since then. We're now distributing, um, you know, other brands as well as our own Flaming Coals and Ozpit products. You know, we're importing um, products from the States, as I mentioned before, SNS Grills is one of those. Um, we've got Cosmos Q, which we import their rub sources, glazes, etc., as well. Um, and then obviously to supplement the range, we sell a whole heap of other, you know, brands that you'll find in other barbecue stores as well. Yeah, now you, you just mentioned uh, flaming coals there, and I've I've been mm-hmm. uh, noticing a lot of them on the competition circuit, and that they seem to be, but particularly the flaming coals offset seems to be a really popular mm-hmm. choice with um, with people getting started in the competition barbecue yeah. scene. How many different models do you have now under the flaming coals banner? Um, so with smokers, we actually only have three models. Um, we've got dozens of spits and spit accessories, but with smokers, um, just the three models. So there's the offset? The offset. Then we have our gravity feed smoker as well. Um, and then we have the extra large gravity feed as well. So the, the two gravity feed, mo- uh, gravity feed models we're finding people are using in food trucks, um, in restaurants, beer gardens, et cetera. Yeah, they're, they're compact. You know, you can, pack a, you can pack heaps and heaps of food in there without taking too much of a big footprint up. Yeah, I I first saw them I think at Kangaroo Valley a couple of years ago. I think Kieran had it might have been like the very oh, first Kieran, one yeah. there. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, the people just sort of flocking around looking at it, and yeah, it was it was really interesting. Well, Kieran's still using those. Yeah. yeah, he's still got them going in his food truck. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Love it. Now, um, so you've. <laughs> my next question was going to be what challenges have you faced getting set up, but we've we've obviously just <laughs> talked about that. Um, uh, yeah. So at, at, at what point in the, in the growth trajectory did you decide to open the second store in Sydney? Well, we were getting a lot of people last minute wanting a product in Sydney for the weekend. So I think with a spit, a lot of people buy it because they've got an event to cater for. Like a smoker, yes, you can cater for an event, but most people buy a smoker just to have, right? Mm. When people are buying a spit, they're usually buying a spit to cater for a kid's birthday, an engagement party, a 40th birthday, that kind of thing. 
And so I don't know why people are organizing these big, you know, occasions at the last minute, but it always seemed to be that on a Thursday or a Friday afternoon, people would be in a flat <laughs> wanting a spit. So who knows? So I felt that we weren't able to help those clients as much as obviously we would have wanted to. So that's when we started Sydney and that was probably only about five years ago. So, and thank goodness I found um, Cameron. We have never looked back. He has got to be the, the star employee um, who treats that business like it's his own. He is a bit of a barbecue guru. I've met him a couple of times and I've had him on the show here as well. And like, he's, he's just as passionate about, uh, about barbecue and about BSR as, as you are yourself. He's, oh, he's yeah. phenomenal. Oh yeah. But everyone goes in there thinking it's his business. I'm like, oh, like go for it. <laughs> he, he treats it like it's his business as well. Yeah. He actually corrected me in the, in about two minutes before we started recording saying, oh, you know, it's not actually my shop. I went, what? <laughs> Because just sort of just sort of stalking him through the socials, it actually looked like it was his shop. So well, the scary thing is that we get people commenting, thinking that he and I are actually together. Like, oh, but I love what you and Cam have done with the store. It's like, oh no, <laughs> definitely. <not. laughs> I don't know how your wife puts up with you, but I certainly wouldn't. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> oh, he, he he's actually joining us now. He's just written his oh, little dear. comment here. Or oh, oh, shucks, there we go. <laughs> Oh. Very funny stuff. So yeah. when you opened the the second store, did that did that add like an extra level of complexity for you or was it sort of nice and smooth sailing? Oh, it definitely added an extra level of complexity. Um, I mean, I moved up there for probably about four months. You can imagine setting up a brand new retail outlet like that has nothing. It's literally just a, a warehouse environment. So, um, you know, the usual stuff like setting up all your, your shop fittings and, and those kind of things and getting all your marketing done and what have you, but, you know, then having to f stock forecast. So a lot of my time is looking at spreadsheets, to be honest, trying to figure out where I'm going to get stock from and making sure they arrive on time before the stock runs out. So that definitely added an extra level of complexity. Um, and because we run, we were running a lot of demos and barbecue classes. It, it certainly added a lot of complexity to my life as well because I was traveling everywhere. Um, I remember one year I had, I like to plan my calendar about a year in advance because I'm very meticulous with my time. And I think it was about 50% of the time I was going to be away from home just be, from whatever reason, either covering his leave or being up there for a barbecue class or a demo or an event or something. So Yes, this last 18 months has probably, you know, allowed me to, to calm it down a little bit, if anything. Yeah, except that um, I, I believe that at the start of the 18 months, didn't you get stuck overseas for like a, like a six or eight week period? Oh, no, my business partner did though. Um, not oh, me. okay. Uh, I had actually made the move by that time to move up to the beautiful Port Macquarie. So um, I was managing the business remotely. And right. Yeah, I'd literally only been up there for about, I don't know, about six weeks when lockdown happened and I was no longer able to get down to Melbourne. So that was probably a bit of a challenging time having my team on the ground here. Um, obviously all that uncertainty, um, they were incredibly busy and I wasn't able to, to get down to help them. But I actually think it was for the better because it allowed me to, I guess, keep that helicopter view and actually run the business and do what was needed rather than getting down into the grassroots and helping him pack a box and, and do those sorts of things. So, yes. But Having that sort of that, that top level perspective, it has obviously paid off for you because you've, uh, you've now found sort of new and, and, and inventive and creative ways that, that you can support and, and grow the wider barbecue community. You've actually built a state of the art, uh, studio kitchen there. T uh, tell us a bit about that project. Yeah, so uh, I'm very fortunate um, to have Michael Wilkie join our team. Um, he's been with us now for almost a year. So some people in the barbecue community might know him from, um, you know, doing all the meat stock videos. So Michael did those um, meat stock videos and obviously I loved his content there. So um, I brought him on board full time. And he's just been smashing out a whole heap of content for us. But he's like, well, we need to do this properly if we're going to do it. So let's build a studio. So we basically carved out a section of um, our warehouse and 
since I mentioned earlier, you know, moving into one warehouse, we now have four warehouses side by side. So as each of the neighbours moved out, we just took over the lease. So we have four factories in a row now. Um, awesome. And one of those now, <laughs> one of those now has a bit carved out for Michael's studio, plus all the equipment, which I never imagined how much equipment you would need. But um, yes, all the money that it would take to buy it all. But anyway, <laughs> I don't even know what half of the stuff does or what it's called or anything. I'm just, sometimes I feel like I'm just oh yeah, no, give me that invoice, I'll pay that. Um, but yeah, we decided we invested in that not only to produce content for ourselves, but there are so many other, I guess, small businesses or, you know, our customers who have turned into entrepreneurs by making their own rubs, et cetera. And I guess it just allows us to be able to help them get their name out there. And we've got the, the manpower, I suppose, to do it. We've now got the studio to do it. So again, it's our way of giving back to those people who have supported us over the years. Yeah, right. So give us a bit of an idea of some of the uh, videos that you've made for BSR and some of the guest pitmasters that have come in and made videos as well. Sure. So lockdown has made it a little bit hard to get people in, um, but we have had Westy from Slow Burner Barbecue. So he's um, been in, I think he's done about half a dozen videos or so. Um, he's done hot dogs in the offset. Um, he's done taco videos. He's actually coming in back. Uh, he's coming back in tomorrow and um, for two days straight, actually, he's doing, I think they're pumping out about six videos, a whole heap of low and slow videos and direct wow. drilling videos, um, all to support his rubs. Yep. So he's trying to take his rubs, you know, a bit further in the market. And obviously you need content to be able to do that. So he and Mike will be working very closely together. Um, we've also had Tom Spinks, who has a huge Instagram following. I think he's got about 30 or 40,000 um, followers. Wow. And he is raising money to set up his own food truck. So Michael spent a day with him in the studio helping pr to prevent, um, promote his brand uh, for, as part of his fundraising efforts. He's got a campaign through Possible. So that um and i know we've got some things teed up with the butcher's axe boys as well as soon as lockdown ends beautiful that sounds lovely i can't wait to see them and so yeah. is that um is that something that you're uh making available uh from the literature that that i read about it you're you're mm -hmm. doing it purely just to support the wider scene is that a um is is that a, a like a revenue stream for the business or is that something that you're doing to support we're not charging for the, it at all no we we're not charging wow. for it. Obviously, we need to be able to fit it into Michael's time ability because it's not just the time that he is spending um, shooting. Obviously, then there's the whole editing process. Um, he's been great. He obviously has been coming in on weekends to help shoot those and also, you know, some cooks obviously go after hours as well. Um, but, yeah, we're not charging people for that. Um, obviously, you know, we have access to the content and we get to share that with our audience to help our audience, but no, it's definitely not ch charging at all for that. Wow. That is phenomenal. That's a huge thing that you're doing to, to, to make the gear available, to make the, the expertise available, to make, mm. you know, it's just, that's a massive investment in the scene. I love it. Thank you for, for, mm -hmm. for, for what you're doing. That's, okay. there. that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, going back to Westy, for example, you know, he was, you know, he's been a long-term customer of ours, has helped us out heaps with demos and classes. And he actually won one of our offsets and we were obviously sponsoring his barbecue team, Moist Barbecue. Um, so he's one of his teammates, Russ, is actually our warehouse manager. So that's how we also have the connection oh, with him as well. Right. So yeah, yeah, it's good to be able to give back to those people that have, um, you know, helped us out along the way as well. Yeah, the BSR family sort of is uh, it is all <laughs> wide and inclusive there, isn't it? Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's what barbecue is. It's a family. Exactly. Really yeah. Is. Very well said. So of all the different things that, that you do and all the different ways that you do it, what is the most rewarding part of, of owning and running BSR for you? I just love when customers keep coming back and showing me photos of what they've cooked. I honestly love them, the pride on their face when they come in and, you know, that, as I said before, they know nothing when they come in and then give them a couple of months and they're like, oh, they're showing me through, you know, all their photos and everything like that. And then they got their brother into it or their, you know, their cousin into it or something like that. It's just seeing how proud they are. You know? And I guess as a business owner, I am probably 
too involved in the day-to-day -day nitty gritty. And so I still answer the phone calls from customers. I still look at emails and I still, you know, help out in the showroom as well. And I, that's because I love it. You know, I love Beautiful. that connection with people and, you know, I still get people, you know, ringing up and saying, oh, you're Rhiannon, you're the one who was doing the YouTube videos. I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> Back in the day before we had Michael, you know, doing all the content and we were there with an iPhone or whatever. Yes, that's me. <laughs> hey, it's amazing the things that you can do with an iPhone these days. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the most, the, the most impressive thing that a customer has come back and shown you that they've done? Um, look, we had a lot of customers who will buy bits and pieces from us um, and then build their own spit, for example. So we've seen um, customers deck out whole trailers with, you know, spits that can cook, you know, five pigs on there. And then go on and a uh, hoi panoi. I don't know if you've heard of hoi panoi, but um, they go around Melbourne and do a whole heap of um, night markets. Okay. And yeah, that customer came in just with a, a bit of an idea that he was going to go to a, a market now and again and bought a whole heap of motors and skewers and bibs and bobs from us. And then, yeah, next time I saw him, he'd come back with this massive trailer and he's got five pigs on there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Crazy. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd Ben Arnott. All righty. Now, this is the part of the show where our guest gets to share some wisdom, share a lesson with the with the listeners and the viewers. So, um, you're going to talk to us today about the, uh, the the Greek Euros that you were mentioning there before. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's let's get a bit of a lesson on that. How do we go about doing that? Cool. All right. So, literally right now in the warehouse behind me, we are cooking a Greek gyro. So, um. I like to do something a little bit controversial. I like to mix my lamb and my chicken together. So literally when you're putting the meat on the skewer, we're mixing red meat and white meat and I'm still alive and kicking. I haven't food poisoned myself yet. All the number of customers that I've done it for at demo. So um, we obviously um, get lamb thigh. That is the best meat to use for a chicken sylvlaki. Um, obviously no, um, no skin. And then with the lamb component, um, we like to use a deboned lamb shoulder. So we, we cut that into like thin kind of strips, about 10 millimetres thick. With the chicken, you don't have to thin it too much, but definitely with the lamb, you need to, to thin it down and, and carve it up. Then we season it. Ideally, you've seasoned it overnight, but you know, today we only got to do it for probably about an hour or so because we were wanted to get the video out. But we've got... Um, some homemade tzatziki that we've also prepared. So that's um, some beautiful Greek yogurt with heaps and heaps of garlic. So we're all, don't, lucky the showroom isn't able to open because we would all just stink like garlic tomorrow, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the garlic and dill and cucumber, and then we'll make those into wraps. So I think the reason why I love cooking um, the Greek style gyros is it's a kind of meat where you just, you can graze on it all day. So the mm. thing that we find is a lot of people use it for gatherings and parties because what you do is you load it all onto the skewer and probably about 90 minutes in, you're ready for your first carve. So what you do is just get a, either a sharp knife or an electric knife and you shave probably about an inch off the outside and then you allow it to continue to cook because only the outside will be cooked. So then you've got this beautiful fresh meat that's carved and then it's gone. You know, everyone picks at it and that's it. And then probably about 40 minutes into it again, you're ready to shave it again. So you're just getting this constant grazing of um, charcoal meat and you baste it with olive oil and lemon juice using sprigs of rosemary and you get a bit of flare up from the oil, but that's beautiful because it crisps it up again from the outside. And oh, there's something about the, the Greek eat oil that I absolutely love. Yeah, right. And, and do you serve it in some of that Greek flatbread as well or is it just sort of absolutely. like a finger food? Well, it depends. Sometimes we literally just stand around the barbecue here and picking it off without even cutting it. Um, <laughs> but today, today we're actually going to be civil and we're serving it in the pita bread with lettuce and onion and tomato and the, the tzatziki and yeah. 
Oh, it's, it's really popular for parties, like especially, you know, 18th birthdays and 21st, you know, you'll advertise the party, you know, starts at seven and then the kids are still rocking up at 10 o'clock, you know, so at least then you've got the fresh meat always ready to be carved. I hadn't thought of that. I love that idea. That's a, mm. that's really good future planning there. Yeah. Now I've, I'm, I'm kind of curious. You, you mentioned that you use the, the boneless lamb shoulder. Now a, a lamb shoulder is usually a, a low and slow cut because of all the different connective tissues in there that need to break down over, over a long time. Mm. Why do you go for the shoulder with the Eros instead of like a lamb leg, for example? Leg. Well, one, it's tradition and that's how Tony's parents always said to do it. You know, they're Greek, they owned a Greek restaurant, so of course they know how to do it. <laughs> Never enough. really questioned it, but I have used uh, lamb once before. It just didn't have enough fat through it. Okay, it was just too lean. It was too lean, yeah. Oh, interesting. Nice, mm. nice. Yeah. yeah, it's a pain in the neck to prepare though, but it takes a lot more effort than the leg I found, but it's worth it. Oh, so do you like manually bone the bone the shoulder yourselves? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. If I'm feeling lazy, I won't. I'll just buy a deboned lamb shoulder. It's probably already been rolled, and then I'll unroll it and then slice it up myself. Um, but obviously we're looking for meat that's only about, you know, a centimetre thick because you want to be able to get the marinade penetrating all the way around it. And, of course, when you're shaving it, you want it to be into smaller pe- like smaller slithers of meat. Yeah, right. And yeah. J- just remind me what that marinade was again. It was olive oil, lemon. Uh, so we based it with a mixture. It was about 50% olive oil and 50% lemon juice. Um, you can put a little bit of salt in there if you like, but we find that the, the Greek yido seasoning that we use has got enough salt in it, so we don't need to add more. Um, and then you just baste it on throughout the cooking process. The lemon just gives it a bit of a, I don't know, a bit of a zing to it. Beautiful. That sounds absolutely delicious. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for sharing that with us. I'm hungry now and I know what I want to do on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, that's probably a good time for us to start uh, to, to wrap up the show now, to wrap up this episode. So I'm going to throw it over to you now. Give some, uh, give some shout outs, give some thanks, give some praises to people that have helped you out along the way and make sure that you tell everybody where we can track down barbecue spit rotisseries on the internet. Sure. So our website is barbecuespitrotisseries.com.au. Uh, we have Instagram, um, Barbecue Spirit Rotisseries or Flaming Coals, um, and then also the same on Facebook. Um, as a shout-out, I would just love to shout-out, obviously, to all of our customers who have been extremely loyal um, during all of the lockdowns. Um, they continue to come back, you know, every Friday or every second Friday to top up with their favourite rubs and charcoals. Um, but most importantly to my team. My team are absolutely phenomenal. Um, We've got a full, apart from our um, offshore team um, in our manufacturing plant, we have a team of 14 people full time. Uh, and I could not do what I do without them. Um, they drive me bananas with the constant phone calls <laughs> and barging into my office and the messages, and I can't get away from them sometimes, but the, I cannot fault their loyalty or dedication. So every single one of them um, is, yeah, I, I, not a day goes by where I do not think how lucky I am to have the, the team that I have. Beautiful. Beautifully said there. Now, before I do let you go, I, I just have one more question for you. You've been, you've been leading, the, uh, leading the way for 15 years now. You've, you've uh, sort of introduced the whole, you know, uh, spit rotisserie idea to Australia. You've, uh, you, you've now moved into this, uh, this content creation uh, video kitchen. Can you give me an idea of what your next plan is? What's, what's next for BSR? Oh, I don't know about for BSR, but for me, I need a rest. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th- I think for, for us, um, for us, it's just to, you know, continue to, to educate people as best that we can, you know, to really ramp up this content creation and share it with as many people as we can, um, get more and more people um, involved. Um, you know, I'd love to see us go into homes of, you know, customers, you know, a cooking with a customer segment or something like that and see how the, the customers are actually using it in real life in their home environment. So that's something I'd really love to, to be seeing um, when all this madness ends. That sounds like a great idea. I love that. Very well done. All right, look, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time. I, I realise that it's uh, that it's after hours at the shop now that you've stayed behind to talk to me and you've got Greek Eros waiting for you. I know, so- I can smell it. I've got people waiting in my office kind of telling me, mm, it's ready. They better not have eaten that first calf without me, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Well, look, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That is the one and only Rhiannon Peterson from uh, from Barbecue Spit Rotisseries. How much fun was that to get that whole large scale idea of the of the evolution of the barbecue scene in Australia and all the different ways that they that they support and they grow the the, the barbecue scene here in Australia. They work with some of the biggest teams. That they've got one of the most well known teams for their customer service within their own. Uh, business unit which is just uh so good to hear and uh we even had cameron himself there chiming in a couple of times in the comments so that's uh that's loyalty from the staff members there to be supporting her even when she's talking about it on a barbecue podcast so there you go all right now before we do wrap this up i just need to remind you about the announcements from the top of the episode if you are looking for a new barbecue or smoker do check out jagged wood fired they're our podcast partner for this episode they make beautiful smoker ovens they've got fantastic gravity fed units beautiful asado grills any kind of custom work you want i've got one of their smoker ovens here in the backyard at the moment i'm doing a video series for them and i love it it's beautiful it's a great bit of kit so do check out the videos if you'd like to know more and talk to them uh, j-a-g-r-d wood fired and uh, um, .com.au that was terrible <laughs> terrible j-a-g-r-d woodfired.com.au now if you are at the start of your barbecue journey head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com grab your free ebook the beginner's guide to real barbecue recently awarded um, for for writing at the nbbqa barbecue conference over in the united states completely free the pop-up window will appear on the website. Put your details in. We'll send that out to you. We've got the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Community over on Facebook, so make sure you come join us there. That's where we've recorded this podcast this evening, and it's where we just hang out and talk about barbecue. All the other guff is left at the door. It's family-friendly, and we just have a good time together. And, of course, if you are catching this later on on the socials, do all the likes and the shares and the comments for us. We really would appreciate that. It helps drive us further up the charts. It helps us spread our message of barbecue love around the world as well. So that really is it for today. So until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. Yeah.